in this ninth uh, item in the sequence on MATLAB basics, we're going to look at the topic of loops. So we've established early on in this sequence that using script files for sequences of operations can be quite useful. But sometimes it's also useful to repeat, that's the key word, to repeat the same operation over and over again, but with slightly different numbers each time. MATLAB provides a convenient mechanism for this by way of loop structures. Now these resources are going to cover an introduction to basic loop structures, two types, for loops and while loops. And again, hopefully the reader will agree, after they've been through this, that the coding is largely intuitive and follows reasoning that's quite common to humans. So first of all, why are loops essential? Code allows repeated numerical computations with loops. Now, often we don't want to have to write the same line of code multiple times to do the same thing but with different numbers. This would simply be tedious. We want to tell the computer to use the same line of code again and again and again but with different numbers and this is what we use loops for to carry basically the same command over and over again but changing the numbers. So there's two common loop structures. There's for loops. With a for loop you specify exactly which values may change during the repeated operations and how many times the operation is repeated. While loops operate slightly differently and they use a conditional to decide whether the loop action should be repeated or not and you may remember that we actually looked at while loops in the previous which is the MATLAB Basics 8. Here's an example then of why we might need a for loop. So if we open this file, MATLAB Basics 9, and what we're going to do is try and compute something six times, so with six different values of x. And you can see here a number of possible different values of x that I'm going to use. Now, first we look at lines 11 to 16. So that's these lines here, which have just been highlighted. So you can see I can compute this uh, output y at six different values of x by simply writing the same line six times and all I change is which value of x I'm using. Now hopefully you agree that's a bit tedious. The alternative is down at the bottom which is this set of lines here and you'll notice here I've got this for loop which we'll explain shortly and I've essentially written the command only once but now I've put a variable k in there so I'm going to allow that variable k to change but I've only had to write the key statement once. Hopefully it's obvious to you this bottom box is much more efficient. Now imagine what would happen if you had to do this command a hundred different times or a thousand different times. You certainly wouldn't want to write the same statement a thousand times over. You'd far rather be able to write it once and have some clever coding to do it for you. And this is why we want to use a loop. So how does a loop work? Well the basic structure is given here where you can see these sort of curvy arrows in this box here. So you'll notice we've got a starting statement which says for k equals 1 colon 6 and an end statement down here. And in between we have some code. Now first of all, instead of writing for k equals 1 to 6, an equivalent statement, I could have just written k equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 um, if I wanted to. They mean the same thing because 1 colon 6 means all the values from 1 to 6 spaced by 1. So how does this loop work then? Well the first thing that happens is we take the first value in this k, which is this 1. So we come into this loop and you'll see we start with k equals 1 and then whatever code we've got in here will be operated with the value k equals 1. So hence here you can see putting k equal to 1 I end up with y2 of 1 equals sine x values of 1. So that's what the code will do. Okay. Now having run all the code we get to the end statement. 
when we get to the end statement, what the code's going to do is say, what's the value of k? And here we'll say, well, the value of k equals 1. And then it will look up here and it will say, oh, there's a number of values of k we haven't used yet. So it will go back up to the start of the loop and it will now take the next value of k, which is the 2. And now we'll run the loop with k equals 2. And then when we get to the end, it will go back, it will run it with k equals 3, and then with k equals 4, and then k equals 5, and then k equals 6. So when we've run through with k equals 6, and we get back to this end statement, what's going to happen now? Well, when k equals 6, we notice that we've now used all the values of k, 1 to 6. So MATLAB will, at this end statement, will look and say, I've used all my possible values of k. I haven't got any more, to, any more values of k to do, so now I continue with the next line of code. So how do we write the statement then? So here's an example. For k equals 3 colon 8, code that we want to operate end. And what that will do is it will take the values k, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that loop will run six times with the six different values of k. Here's a different alternative. For k equals 4, colon 3, colon 13. And you can see these values of k would be 4, 7, 10 and 13 because that's essentially what 4, 3, 13 means. It means 4, comma 7, comma 10, comma 13. So this loop will run four times with those given values of k. Here's another alternative. For k equals 8, colon minus 2, colon 2, and you can see that this expression is equivalent to 8, 6, 4, 2. So now the values of k are counting down rather than counting up. Now in general, I can actually write the statement like this. You can see for k equals a comma b comma c comma d all the way up to some uh, value f. And the key point here is the values of k do not need to be equispaced. They can be, you know, randomly spaced if you want. You can go 1, 5, 3, minus 6, 25. It doesn't really matter as long as you put them in the right syntax. So the correct syntax is for k equals vec. So some general examples of for loops in action then. So open the file MATLAB Basics 9a and here you'll notice the call statement or for the for loop has got three variables in it start, step and end p. So how many times this loop runs depends on what you put in start, what you put in step, what you put in np because that affects the definition of this vec. Now for these given values if we run it this is what you see. You see first of all k equals 0 which corresponds to start then k equals 0.2 which corresponds to start plus step then k equals 0.4 which is start plus 2 times step and so on all the way to the end till we get to 1.2 which is the end value. So you can hopefully see clearly here how the code in this loop has run for every value of k in vec. What about nested loops? Well you can actually nest loops. So here's an example MATLAB Basics 9b. You'll see there's an inner loop here for l equals 1 to 5, akl equals k times l and then end. And then there's also an outer loop k equals 1 to 10 and end. So what will happen here? Well the first thing that will happen is we will choose k equals 1 so that's the first value of this outer loop k equals 1 and once k equals 1 I will then run every part of this inner loop with k equals 1 so L will go from 1 to 5 then I will reset k to 2 and once again L will go from 1 to 5 and I go all the way through until k equals 10 and once again L will go from 1 to 5 now we'll run this file in a minute and show how these nested loops have worked in this case. Now the loop counters can be variables because it may be that the number of times a loop is needed or indeed the variables to be used in the loop are unknown when you're doing the coding because they're supplied as a user input or 
as a consequence of some earlier computations in the code. Now we can illustrate this with a simple example MATLAB Basics 9F which again we'll look at in a bit. And the key thing you'll notice is a general statement is often something like this. For counter equals A colon B colon C where A, B and C can be determined as a consequence of earlier code or user input. So let's move to the live demonstrations and here's some of the files that you may choose to look at. So let's find our MATLAB window, there we go, and our other MATLAB window, there it is. So here's MATLAB Basics 9A, you can see it's the file which has got start, step, end. So first of all I'll just run this one and that's the same as you saw in the notes but the key thing is you'll notice I can change it. So for example I can make step equal to 0.3 if I now run it, what do you see? I get 0, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 1.2. I could change that end to be something like 5.2, run it again, and now you see it's got all these different values from 0 up to 5.1. <coughs> okay, so now let's have a look at 9b. So 9b is this example with the nested loop. Now what I'm going to do here is change that k to go only from 1 to 2, change the L to go only from 1 to 4 and now I'm going to run it and you'll see what happens. The first time through K equals 1 and then I run L 1 to 4 so you can see A becomes just a single row so we get A 1 comma L equals K comma L so we define the first row of A. Next time through k is 2. So now we're going to define the second row of A and you can see that's what comes out here, the second row of A with these different values of L. If I make k go to 3, you'll see now A is built up one row at a time till there were three rows. So here you can see first row, two rows, three rows and there's the final result. I could change this operation, I've got k times L, I could make it k times L squared and run it and now you see we get different values in the matrix A. Okay, now let's go to 9D. So 9D is an example which shows a combination of for loops with conditionals, conditionals we covered in the early resource. So you can see the for loop is going to take values of k from 1 to 10. And then I've got conditionals saying, well if k is less than 4, I want to do one operation. If k is less than 8, I've now got some other conditionals to add and I've also got an else if k is not less than 8. Now you can look at this code more slowly in your own time by getting the code off the website but let's just run it and then if we have a look and see what comes out in H and you'll see this is what's come out. So k equals 1, I end up with 1 and there you can see that corresponds to h of k equals k if k is less than 4. So we've got 1, 2, 3. Now if k equals 4, you can see k is less than 8, k is also less than 7, so h of k is the square root of k. And so you see we end up with 2. Now I'll let you um, follow the rest of the code in your own time, but hopefully you're beginning to see the point. I can combine this for loop with conditionals. Now the final one we want to look at is 9F. Now this again is a combination of conditionals and a for loop, but here we're going to use the conditionals to define the user input. So we want the user to put in their age. You'll see this question, what is your age? And we're going to use the conditionals to make sure that the person puts in a sensible value and doesn't try and break the um, computer. So again you can look at those conditional statements in slower time and check you understand what they work. Having done that we're then going to run a loop which goes from 1 to the person's age in order to work out the accumulation of their savings. So let's run this file then. So we go run, we say what is your age? So you see if I put in something like 2.5 it will come back and say this is not a positive integer, you're being silly, try again. What if I put minus 6? Oh, uh, my code's not good enough for that, so we'll have to run it again. I've not put a protection in against negative numbers. Uh, so, 
8.3. So what is your age as an integer? So now let's put in something sensible like 25. And then it runs the for loop, generates the savings, and then generates this plot to show how your savings accumulate as you get older. So you'll notice I've put in this check that they've put in a sensible value, but I haven't included in that check um, a code to say have they put in a negative number. So that's something that should be added to this code to make it more robust. OK, so conclusions. We've demonstrated the usefulness of for loops for executing the same command multiple times with slightly different numerical values. And this allows complex computations to be tested and saved for easy use later. In general terms, for loops are one of the most common structures you're going to see in coding, and it's essential that you become skilled in these.